start off this episode a question from subscribers we got a very unpopular opinion about the baltimore ravens and it came from my guy sebastian he said great great revenge game versus the jaguars for the ravens but I'm about to say something that will tick off some fans. Here we go. Let's get straight into it. Now, he said, you know what? Before we get into it, make sure you subscribe to the channel and leave a like on the video. <laughs> but based on what he's about to say, I don't want you to take it out on me. I'm just the messenger. But let's get into it. He said, I'm going to have to evaluate really hard if I want to give Justin Matabike an extension. Ooh, ooh, ooh. He said, don't get me wrong. I freaking love his leap from last year. But almost half of his sacks this year have been cleanups caused by the pressure from the edge like he's getting blocked good as qb scrambles or steps up in the pocket and just runs to his arms then boom it's a sack but hey sacks are sacks yet honestly i'd extend pq first because he also adds to the pass rush element or i'm gonna just save the money for that kyle hamilton and linda Baum extension if you're the gm who would you extend pq matabike geno stone or save the money for our future. Also, primetime Kyle Hamilton is slowly reaching the GOAT levels of playoff Ed Reed. LOL. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Now, hey, Kyle Hamilton is nice. He is one of the best players, not only on the Baltimore Ravens defense, but on their team. But Ed Reed, hold up now, buddy. Now, he do got some stats that do compare. But anyway, we'll get into that another day. So, about Justin Matabike, where you talked about he's getting almost half his sacks this year have been cleanups. What about the other half? And see, my, my thing with sacks is that it's all about closing, closing and finishing the job. So whether it's clean up sacks, whether it's you just getting pressure from the jump sacks, however you get it, he got it. He got it. So I, I, I can't sit up here and say, oh, he ain't worth it or, or, or complain about it because he's closing. That has been an issue with the Baltimore Ravens for years. Them not being able to close on the sack. It, it, it had even been an issue earlier this year. Now we know, I, I love my guy, hashtag JC24, Jadavian Clowney, but you know, like, he's supposed to have, like, 18, 20 sacks right now if he were just able to close a lot better. But you see, with Justin Matabike, he has been closing. So I, I got no problem with the fact that, yeah, if they clean up sacks, okay, he's getting them. He's bringing the quarterback down and ending the play. Well, in some cases, forcing some fumbles, too. So I got no problem. But another thing, too, context is important. Because while the context says he already got a bunch of sacks, he also got, I want to say, 30 QB hits, too. So it's not just the sacks that he's doing. He's getting back there. He's getting to the QBs. So Justin Matabike is balling. And to your next question, he said, if you're the GM, who would you extend? Matabike. That, that'd be my first guy right there. Because the Baltimore Ravens have struggled for years to find somebody this, disrupt, this, this consistently disruptive. On the interior of the defensive line, it's been a, a struggle for years. The last person we had that was consistently disruptive like this on the interior of the defensive line, Lodi Nada. That's the last one I can remember. Lodi Nada. I thought it was going to be Tim Jernigan. It was looking like it could have been, but things ain't work out. He fell out of favor, then he got traded to the Eagles, and that was that. But Lodi Nada. So with Justin Matabike, and I know a lot of another thing that people bring up with Justin Matabike, oh, why is he doing it now? Why did he wait until now to start going off? Why, oh, after all these years that he was with the Ravens, how come he didn't go off back then? Context is important. You had Calais Campbell here before. And Calais Campbell, Justin Matabike was not a starter before. Justin Matabike had to come in uh, when Calais Campbell would go out or some other guys would go out, and then he could come in and then try to, try to do his thing in limited amount of snaps. Now his snaps are not limited. So that's why he's been going off like that. So with Justin Matabike, I think it's a no-brainer that you got to try to get this thing done for sure. As far as PQ, I would love for them to keep PQ as well. Um, but I think with Justin Matabike, um, with him getting his bread, uh, with Patrick Queen, uh, with Roquan Smith getting his bread, uh, we'll see. Now, one thing I got to do a much better job of, and my apologies, we got to show a lot more love to our Team Keep It Clean patrons because the Team Keep It Clean patrons, Every single month, every single day, they show extra support towards the channel that does help out tremendously. So Team Keep It Clean patrons, I really appreciate y'all. I appreciate y'all being so patient. I know a lot, a lot of people canceled their Team Keep It Clean uh, Patreon membership, and I get it. I, I get it, but I, I really appreciate the ones that have been there, that have ever been there. And even if you canceled it, I still appreciate you like crazy. Thank you for having even just one time, even if it was for one month or even just one day. Thank you for being a Team Keep It Clean patron. Now, for anybody that would like to or continue to be a Team Keep It Clean patron, 
You can go to patreon.com slash Shane Graven visit. And if you do not want to, I get it. That's fine. But no, I love y'all like crazy. Now we're going to get into some questions from some of our team. Keep it clean patrons. This next one came from my guy, Nick Brick. So he said, uh, this has been a crazy season, but you ain't lying. You ain't lying. He said, the past two weeks, I've seen a team battle back after things not going perfectly, which is what I've been waiting for from these guys for a long time. Well, this brings me to my question. I thought Harbaugh was horrendous in the Chargers game. However, outside of the weird challenge of the Demarcus Robinson touchdown, which I kind of did agree with his justification after the game. Yeah, yeah. And, and I agree too Because watching it live is like Harbaugh What are you doing What are you challenging What is going on But then after he gave his explanation It's like oh, Okay Hobbs, We get it uh, But he said uh, The past two weeks He's been pretty flawless Both coordinators Are making halftime adjustments He's keeping the players Calm and positive When momentum goes the other way And he didn't seem to get desperate In either game Like we've seen before You know what That's a really really good point I'm glad you brought that out Because that's something That I have been thinking about A little bit But I'm glad you really Brought this back to mind um, there's been a lot of times throughout the past couple of games where I've been thinking, oh, oh yeah, they about to go for it. Go for it, Ravens. Go for it. Go for it on fourth down. And they say, no, we're going to punt. Or even, oh, kick the field goal. No, no, we're going to punt. Ravens have really been being patient and really been playing the long game, really been playing field position, really trusting their defense in a lot of situations. So... It's obviously paid off. Anyway, continuing. Uh, he said, in the past two weeks, I've just seen a more humble team that doesn't believe they should blow everyone out and that takes it four quarters. We talk about Lamar and the other guys on the team, but in your opinion, do you think John Harbaugh has taken the next step as a coach? Kind of weird to say about a 15-year head coach, but I think since the Lamar era, he's had a hard time adjusting to an entirely different version of football and expectations. I think the whole organization has. Mm, it's a small sample size, but the past two weeks are the best I've seen Harbaugh in a long time. What are your thoughts? Ooh, that's a really, really good question. Deep question, too. Has, has a Harbaugh taken that next step? Mm. And, yeah, uh, that is something to say about it. Yeah, 15 years since he's he been here since 2008. He's been head coaching since 2008. All for the same team, the Baltimore Ravens. That, that's a rarity right there. But um, I hope so. Uh, it's all about consistency now. Uh, but something that you talked about, um, yeah, the, the games that we've seen, the, the the resiliency from the Baltimore Ravens and the way that they've been they've been able to close out stuff. Like in a Chargers game, that game was ugly. It was ugly, ugly, ugly. Then Chargers started getting momentum, but Ravens end up closing it out. In the Rams game, oh my goodness, Rams started off with momentum and then they went back forth, back forth, back forth. Then Rams had control. Ravens will fight back. Rams will have control again. Ravens will fight back, and Ravens ended up getting it. It's crazy. And then in a Jaguars game, uh, Ravens, they weren't really in control control, but the Jags, they started coming back. And it, was, it wasn't necessarily a back and forth thing, but Ravens just, they were letting the Jags hang around. And then finally, they, did, they finally started pulling away a bit and closing out. So Ravens have been better closers. So I, I think it is important, like you highlighted, because we talk about uh, how everything starts at the top. Uh, it's important that in Baltimore Ravens struggles, we, 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 we talk about the players, but we also talk about coaching, how everything starts at the top. So it's very important in Baltimore Ravens success. How, of course, yeah, we credit the players for playing, but you also got to give credit uh, to John Harbaugh and the Baltimore Ravens coaching staff for sure. Next question came from another Team Keep It Clean patron, my guy Dominic, and he said, what's up, Engraven? Hope you are having a good day so far. Oh, yeah, things are great right now. He said, after watching this game with Lamar and Likely, do you think the trust is there with them two now? For sure. For sure. Um, and the biggest play that showed the trust was Lamar giving Likely a chance when Lamar had escaped all that pressure, Lamar was like, look, I ain't about to be escaping all this pressure and let this play go to waste. We about to do something. It's going to be something crazy. Is it something really good? Or, hey, if it's something really bad, we about to do something crazy, though. I ain't about to do all this for nothing. So he, he um, moved out of Smoot, had escaped, and then got some more pressure, threw it up to Likely, gave Likely a shot. Gave him a shot. Two defenders over there gave Likely a shot. Trusted him. Said, oh, yeah, Likely, I'm going to give you a chance to make this play for us. And Likely did it. The trust is definitely there. Because had he not trusted Likely, he would have threw that ball away. He would have threw that ball to somebody else or threw it away. Or taken a sack or just done something where it didn't go Likely's way. So, yeah, I think the trust is definitely there. Uh, he said, I know Likely isn't that third down threat yet as Andrews, but I think Lamar trusts him enough for that 50-50 ball. What do you think? Oh, yeah, yeah, I should have finished reading the question. And that's exactly what that was. That was more like, that was more like a 30-40-30 ball. 
And with Isaiah likely being one of the 30% chances to get it, and the other two Jaguars defenders being the other 30 and 40. Uh, but well, I think I got the math messed up on that one. But anyway, you get what I'm saying. He also said, what's up, Engraven? Hope you're having a good day. Um, now, uh, I hope you're doing well. So I just seen this post about comparing Aaron Donald's defensive player of the year in 2020 to Matt Abike this year. Uh, and here are the numbers. Donald had 27 to solo tackles, 18 assists, uh, 13 and a half sacks, and one fumble recovery in 16 games in 2020. Okay. Matt Abike so far has 33 solo tackles, so more solo tackles, 12 assists, so six less assists, uh, and 12 sacks, so one and a half sacks less in 14 games this season. Oof. Underrated for sure is, is this uh, the word and – he said, underrated for sure is the word, and we can't let a player like this walk, can we? No, you don't. That's what we were just talking about earlier. You don't because Matabike is showing that he can close. He can finish the, the job, and Ravens, they ain't had somebody like that in a long time. So you, you got to take advantage of that and, and get that extension done one way or another. See, the Baltimore Ravens, they knew, though. The Baltimore Ravens are smart. They knew. They knew Matabike was something special because – they tried to sign him before uh, this season. They tried to sign him this, this past offseason. They tried to get it done this offseason, but they just couldn't come to terms. So I, I would definitely assume that they are going to continue to try even more. Next question came from my guy Chance from Omaha. He said, wondering your views on Marlon Humphrey. I feel like he has been good, but not great outside of his punch-out season. He has yet to be able to, to cover the deep route, track the ball, or get interceptions. Can he improve or... Is this his ceiling? Haven't really seen much growth from him since his big payday covering the deep ball, especially. What say you? Ooh, that's a question right there. Now, you know what's funny? If I go back to um, April 28th of 2017, uh, on Twitter, somebody had tweeted me, my guy Corey, Corey Lindy. He said, Engraven Vids, y'all going to like my mans out of Alabama, Marlon Humphrey. I promise. Hashtag roll tide. And I said, good. I'm looking forward to him. And then my guy, Bud, who's a big Bama fan, he said he gets burnt so much, though. He gets burnt so much. And then he also said he was great in coverage, and he's a hard hitter. He never could defend the 50-50 ball against taller receivers, though. And I said just hoping for the best. And, again, that was back on April 28th of 2017. That's when he put me on to some of Marlon Humphrey's game. And, and those are some things that we have seen uh, from time to time where Marlon Humphrey will struggle with tracking the ball. Uh, you know he's not a big interception guy, but with a lot of Alabama cornerbacks, they play the receiver. I think they're taught to play the receiver and not really the ball. I mean, except uh, Trayvon Diggs. I mean, he that, that boy plays the ball. That boy is a receiver. But anyway, um, with Marlon Humphrey, uh, uh, I think with him, his strong suit is playing press coverage. Um, and really defending on those short to intermediate routes. Uh, the deep ball, that that has still been a struggle of his from time to time. I wouldn't say there's been no improvement since his big payday. I think Marlon is a pretty consistent corner. He's a corner that usually he can erase his side of the field or erase a, a receiver out the game. Uh, he does, like Eric Weddle talked about years ago, sometimes he does just have those lapses in the game where stuff just happens. Um, but overall, I, I think Marlon Humphrey is still a really, really uh, good cornerback. He does have a rough game from time to time. Like both times where he first came back this year from injury, he had a rough game. And I guess it was because of the injury because after that, he plays just fine. Because, again, he came back for the Rams game, and whew, that was ugly. Oh, my goodness, that was so ugly. And he came back for the, um, oh, the Steelers game, and he gave up that touchdown to, to George Pickett. But it's – Marlon Humphrey not a bad corner at all. Um, and a as far as what you talked about, um, you asked, can he improve or is this his ceiling? People can always improve. As long as you got an opportunity, another opportunity to do whatever it is that you're doing, we can always improve. So Marlon Humphrey certainly can get even better. Next question came from my guy, Jack. He said, do you think Marcus Williams has been looking good since coming back from injury or should Geno Stone be the permanent starting safety and, and free safety he will be referring to? And should we resign Geno Stone and trade Marcus Williams? Anyway, can't wait to hear your opinion on this. Sorry for the long question. Oh, this was not a long question at all. Not even close. Um, Marcus Williams, uh, he has been looking better um now of course he did get hurt in the Jaguars game right at halftime and didn't come back so we'll see but um he has been looking better 
um, as he's got gone, as the time has gone along, as he's gotten more and more healthy, which is a great thing. Uh, I was still in favor of Geno Stone continuing to be the starting free safety because um, I just I just felt like what he was doing was just amazing, and then everything just stopped, and that was when Marcus Williams came back, of course, but. It's, it's tough because I get the Ravens are like, hey, Marcus Williams, that's our better free safety. And, and Geno Stone, he would be more fitting for to be a better strong safety. Because maybe they, they were thinking about Marcus Williams as a strong safety. And like, no, you got to be more physical. He's still dealing with his injury. Let's just leave him at free safety. I, I think they were looking for the safety of the team and the safety of possibly not giving up big plays due to missed tackles. But um, if Marcus Williams would have been at strong safety, because, again, you got to be more physical and whatnot because you're engaging with tight ends more, you may be playing them around the line of scrimmage more. It all just depends on how, how the defense is called. But um, I – see, now it's tricky because, again, when Geno was on his hot streak, I was like, yeah, I'm all for it. You, you cannot let Geno Stone go. But the only way that I would want them to, to, to re-sign Geno Stone is if he could be the free safety. If he could be the free safety and he wasn't not going to be the strong safety, I said, okay, yeah, go for it. But because the, the, in my opinion, this is just me. A lot of people know more X's and O's and all that stuff way more than I do. Y'all know way more than I do by 10 times. I guarantee it. But in my opinion, if you're going to, if Geno Stone just remains the, the strong safety, you're not going to get the best Geno Stone you can possibly get in my opinion. I think for Geno Stone, for you to get the best Geno Stone you can get, he would need to be a free safety. But with Baltimore Ravens, if Marcus Williams is here, then he's not going to do that. So I would say that Geno Stone should just move on so he, he can get the best out of his career that he could possibly get too. It ain't just about the Ravens. It's about him too. So, um, if, if again, if he could stay and be the free safety, okay, cool. But if he can't, then I would say move on. Next question came from my guy Anthony. He said, what's up, Ingram? It's been a minute. Hope you and the fam are great. Oh, yeah, we're doing really good. I appreciate that. He said, so the Ravens have been rotating Ronnie and Makari. And I know it may look bad for Ronnie given he hasn't been doing so well, but I think it may be beneficial for him. Number one, it keeps him fresh uh, and keeps his legs fresh during the game. Number two, it's not putting such a workload on Ronnie Stanley. Like Hobbs uh, said, he's dealing with an injury that is preventing him from performing 100%. Do you think this rotation will continue, or do you see Ronnie and Makari being a full starter by the playoffs? As always, God bless and trust. That's a great question. That is such a great question. Um, now, it's something that you talked about. You, you don't think, oh, oh, it doesn't put such a workload on Ronnie, but he's a starting right tackle. You're supposed to be able to take on this workload. If, if you're a starter, especially on the offensive line, that's, that's a position where there is not rotation. There. Well, normally it's not rotation there. With the Ravens, they do things their way. But So you're supposed to be able to take on this workload. But hey, if he is dealing with injuries, because, again, context is important, he is dealing with injuries. Like you said, it does help his legs remain fresher. So maybe this is Ravens gearing up for some special kind of lineup they got in the playoffs. Again, maybe they 2012 this thing. Because you know how they switch stuff up in the playoffs come 2012, and, and it worked all the way to the Super Bowl. So, hey, maybe they're doing the same thing. So I wouldn't be too mad at it if that was the case. But this is – um, I do think – with them doing this whole rotation thing, I think this is sort of spelling the beginning of the end for Ronnie Stanley with the Baltimore Ravens. Next question came from my guy Elijah. He said, what's up, Engraven? Congratulations on a new addition. It seems like yesterday I was laughing at the video when another Team Keep It Clean member made a mention of that, and you were like, oh, no, buddy. Now we fast forward, and you have a new bundle of joy on the way. Appreciate that. Summertime. Summertime, baby. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, we got... I think, what, six months? Something like that. Yeah, six and a half months. But yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's happening fast. But anyways, he said, for my question, which I really don't have one, but I prefer your opinion. I'm glad we are on pace to finish the season with most of our preseason prediction. Up until now, I called every game right, even our trap game against the Colts. This part of my schedule is where my bias comes in. <laughs> He said, I, I had a sweep in the NFC West, but this is the time 49ers always get healthy around this time. He said, man, fantasy football. Shaking my head. I had us beating the Jaguars, Dolphins, and Steelers closing out the season. Uh, Christmas game always depended on health to me. I'm not on board that train. If any game we should drop, it's the game against the 49ers. I'm on the Super Bowl train. If any games we need to make statements in, it's the Jags, 49ers, and Dolphins. It's time for Team Keep It Clean to get on this Super Bowl train because it's running express. We getting that first round by Super Bowl, baby. I love it. I love it, and, and yeah, hey, this this game against the 49ers, man, it's 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 weird because it's it's not it's a big game, but it's not a big game because they're not they in the NFC. But at the same time, it's a big game because the Ravens want to keep pacing. And you talked about the first round bye, you, the, the the Browns are hot on your tail, so you you gotta keep 
pace and, and other teams too, not just the Browns, but it's a lot of other teams that are close. Ravens got a little cushion, but they ain't got that much cushion. So to get even more cushion to keep the cushion that you got, you got to win. This question came from Norma, and Norma, I'm giving her a pass because she sent it to the wrong email, but I give her a one-time pass. She said, hey, Engraven, how are you? Oh, we're doing really good. I, I appreciate you. She said, now for the, the serious question, what will happen to Lamar Jackson if we don't put someone reliable at left tackle before Monday Night Football against the 49ers? Lamar will get seriously hurt before the game is over. Why did we not take Sue? We need help, and Harbs is playing the, we paid you a lot, so you must play even if you get Lamar Jackson hurt game, and it makes no sense. Ronnie Stanley is a liability, and there is no getting around it. What do you think? That's a really, really good question. And, yeah, you did say serious question. Um, we've seen a lot of plays where we see Ronnie Stanley getting pushed back right into Lamar Jackson. We see Lamar having to avoid Ronnie Stanley uh, even quicker than he has to avoid some of the defenders that are coming at him. And it's a scary thing to watch. Now, um, we will definitely hope that it, it improves, Ronnie Stanley improved, but... Oof, against the uh, Jaguars, boy, he was struggling, my goodness. Uh, one thing we could hope for is that the Baltimore Ravens can establish a run game because that would um, allow life to be made easier for the offensive line. Uh, and just that maybe they could give some help, maybe send Patrick Ricard over there, Gus Edwards, Melvin Gordon, and pass protection justice. It just give them some help. Uh, but then you got Morgan Moses on the other side too. Morgan Moses has been struggling too now. Um, so – it's just you just gotta hope, <laughs> hope that things get better uh, for the offensive line because that is the key to the Baltimore Ravens' entire offense. Like, yeah, hey, we love these plays with Lamar. He's making people miss and doing all this stuff, and then throw the ball downfield and it's a completion. We love that, but we would hope that everything ain't gotta be so hard all the time. That life could be made a lot easier by the Baltimore Ravens' offensive line. Next question came from my guy, BB. He said, what's up, Engraven? Looking forward to this matchup with the Ravens and the 49ers. I think the most important part of this game will be the play of the wide receivers. Ravens wide receivers, instead of being route runners, need to be playmakers. Going against this 49ers team, it will take more than the playbook to get the dub. I, I agree. I agree because they bring it. Offense, defense, like, they bring it. And they bring it so many different ways on both sides of the ball. It's, it's crazy. This is such a crazy, fun matchup, man. He said, going against this 49ers team, um, Oh, the, the, also the run defense has to be lights out with the likes of Debo and CMC. Situational coaching has to be aware if adjustments need to be made. It will have to happen immediately. Yes, because this 49ers team, they don't take no prisoners, man. And, and if they find something that they're exploiting, they will continue to try to exploit it. And they, try to, they will try to run you out their house. So, yeah, the Ravens, ooh, they better be on point. He said the, the O-line will have their biggest test this weekend. So, Makari and Stanley will have to protect Lamar Jackson. Your thoughts? Congratulations to you and your family with the new addition to the flock. Much love. And he put hashtag team keep it clean and hashtag Super Bowl bound. Yes, I, I appreciate that a lot. And yeah, this this is a it's a crazy game, man. It's gonna be a stressful game. Um, it is gonna be a fun game though. It, it should be a really fun game. But it, it seems like all the team keep it clean is definitely on the same page with just needing the Baltimore Ravens to protect Lamar Jackson. Whether it's Makari, whether it's Stanley, whether it's Falele, whether it's Morgan Moses, Zeitler, Linda Flender, uh, John Simpson, uh, Gus Edwards, Justice Hill, um, Melvin Gordon, whoever. Yes, you got to protect Lamar Jackson for sure because that helps life just be so much easier for everybody. Uh, but, yeah, they are going against probably their biggest test this season thus far. The Browns, they were a huge test as well. Uh, but the 49ers, they are a huge test too uh, with Chase Young now too and Nick Bosa and Fred Warner and, like, and Ward. and it, They just nice, man. They nice and, and Armstead and Hargrave, they could possibly be ready for this game. And it was, yeah, man, so Ravens. Ooh, yeah. And the last question on this episode came from my guy, Jarvo. He said, great win, but it came with a price. So sad we lost Keaton Mitchell for the year and definitely don't see nobody replacing him. My question for you is, how do you see us matching up against the 49ers? Mitchell, Mitchell would have been a great piece for this game, but Niners been blowing every, everyone out and we must play perfect football. Who wins this game and what needs to happen to pull off this win? Well, for the Ravens to win, it's simple. They they just got to get more points than the 49. Nah, no, I'm playing. But um, they uh execution is important. Obviously, it starts from the top with coaching. Um, just recognizing stuff, realizing stuff in real time. 
um, and being quick to like the previous question talked about being quick to make those adjustments, not waiting for forever to make those adjustments, but also uh, looking to exploit things, looking for weaknesses in the 49ers that you can take advantage of. If you see something is working, if you see that it is making the 49ers struggle, keep at it. Don't go away from what works. Uh, tackling. I think the biggest thing in this game, in my opinion, will be for the Baltimore Ravens to tackle because the 49ers are a huge team when it comes to yak. They got some great playmakers on their side of the ball on offense. Brock Purdy. Um, there's been a lot of talk about him being a game manager. I really, really appreciate what Kyle Hamilton said about him, where he talked about how Brock Purdy, he don't feel like he's a game manager. And he, he said that boy can play. Uh, he said he does have some nice weapons and whatnot, but he's making all the throws and whatnot because he is. He really is. Because I think about it like this, like, hey, if that was Lamar Jackson and his job was being made easier by his weapons, by his receivers, running backs, whoever, offensive line, play calling, coaching, if his job was made, be, being made easier by all oh, yeah, I'm, I'm all for it. I would love that. And I love when we do see that. And I felt like we have seen that a lot more this year than other years to where I feel like Lamar's still doing a lot. He still does a whole lot for the Baltimore Ravens team. But this year, I feel like it's been able to – the pressure has been able to be alleviated off of him uh, a lot. Um, but, yeah, man, tackling is just so important because when you got a Debo, you got a CMC, you got a Kittle, um, you got Ayuk, you got all these guys that they can make so much plays after the catch. Ravens got to wrap up, and then I think that will be the biggest way. If they can prevent all the yak stuff, that will be the biggest way that they can win this game against the 49ers.